We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Marta Tudon, and I'm the Digital Rights Coordinator of Article 19 Office for Mexico and Central America. And it's a real pleasure pleasure to be here. I'm going to be moderating this uh, session and I'm also going to be the one that has the role of being very annoying with the time. So uh, I'm going to be trying to control the time and I'm going to ask the panelists that when they start hearing some music on my part, they have one minute to just wrap up their ideas and let the other person continue. So we are here because Article 19 is trying to present a proposal about how we can reduce the power of the concentration of power of digital platforms, because we all know because of several reasons that different impacts all their power have in our lives. So that's why we're here. Um, Maria Lisa Stasi, she's the one from Article 19 um, office, the international office that work on this proposal. So she's gonna present it. She's gonna ha have five minutes for it. We, she's gonna respect as well. And then we're gonna have two rounds of questions for our panelists, which I will introduce later on. So you're very, uh, I hope you're comfortable. You're very welcome to be here. And Maria Luisa, you have five minutes to please tell us about our proposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Marta, and um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Indeed, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank all the other, uh, all the, the other speakers as well, to take the time to join this panel and provide feedback and uh, discuss with us this proposal. Um, I am going to be uh, brief, as you have understood, and. Uh, um, I um, yes, uh, I, I will build on what what uh, Marta said. So uh, basically, um, our uh, our main um, uh, reason to come up with this proposal is because of all the challenges that we know we have today with content creation algorithms and the way content creation is performed on the major uh, uh, platforms uh, today. Um, there is a lot of research and some courageous uh, uh, whistleblowers, they have uh, even reinforced our, our perception of how many challenges do we have. But uh, uh, the solution we have tried to uh, present, we will try to present and discuss today, um, it's, uh, it focuses on a market perspective, let's say. Uh, so content creation is a service that today is offered in a bundle, in a package, together with other services. Uh, the main one is hosting. Uh, so every time we go on a large uh, uh, social media platform, we create a profile and we have uh, the content created by the same platform. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it makes a lot of economically, uh, uh, economic sense for the platform for a number of reasons, uh, and it's extremely easy to monetize. Uh, but it, it does, it's not uh, a necessity. So those two services, they can well be offered in a separate way. Uh, and, uh, uh, and our our thinking is that uh, why this doesn't happen, why this, uh, what we would need to make this happen, uh, and why this would be uh, convenient. Um, so the basic of our proposal is uh, to, um, as, as Marta said, to unbundle the hosting and the content creation, to ask the, the, the large um, platform to unbundle those two services and to allow third party players to come in and provide the content creation services to the, the users. Um, in order to, to function, this proposal will need to be carefully designed. And what we're convinced about is that uh, this uh, phase of carefully designing it should be uh, um, part of a, of a uh, very comprehensive uh, debate. It cannot be relegated to a closed regulatory dialogue between the regulator and the large platforms for all the relevant stakeholders to be involved. And uh, for what we can we can say already, uh, uh, we make a number of recommendations. So first of all, it should be effectively implemented by an independent regulator uh, because platforms simply don't have the incentive to do that in form of a self-regulation. Um, it, uh, it, it should uh, be offered, our suggestion is that this should be, should be designed as a form of a functional separation. So the platform should actually be free to keep providing the content creation to the users that they want this. 
and uh, we are extremely uh, um, aware of, of uh, a number of biases and a number of nudges. Uh, so that's why we believe that uh, this should be presented uh, to users as an opt-in. Uh, so users should uh, actively decide uh, the content creation provider they want to have. And if they want to stay with a large platform, they have to expressly say and choose that. Um, this is um, a sort of a safeguard that we think is, is the bottom line. Uh, the other the, the other characteristics we can already suggest is that uh, uh, users say they should be able to make this choice at the beginning and at any point in time. Every time there is a new service that comes into the market that is more innovative, that they like the most, and they, they should be able to switch extremely in an extremely easy uh, and smooth way. So those are the main characteristics we can already envisage, and I'm more than happy to have this discussion with you today. Uh, just the last point is why we do believe that it's so important to break this bundle and to open this market. Uh, well, we, we see that there are a number of advantages, but the three main that I want to present now is, first, we're going to give some power back to consumers, to users. Uh, which, which, um, which is uh, something that they don't have now. Uh, they will have uh, real choices and we have possibility to exercise those choices. Second, we will have competition on the market. We will have a variety of players that will provide a variety of services. And we, want, we will shift from a very highly concentrated uh, uh, scenario where a lot of power is in the hand of one or few companies to a decentralized scenario where this power is diluted. And we think that this is way more uh, um, in line with our democratic values. I'll stop here and I'm sure I'm, I'm very eager to listen to, uh, to your feedback and comments. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maria Luisa. So now it's the time for the first round of questions, but first I'm gonna introduce our experts. So um, the panelists are Marcel Collaja. He's from the European Parliament, member of the Pirate Party. We have also Agustina del Campo. She's the director of CELE, Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information from the University of Palermo. We have Corey Doctorow, from he's a EFF special advisor, and we have Vittorio Bertola, head of policy and innovation and open exchange. Uh, so for the first round of questions, we have five minutes per question, per, per answer. So when you start hearing the music, it means you have one minute left. Um, the first question is for Marcel. Um, we want to review the role of content curators through the market perspective. So what, why would you say it's important for the European Union to diversify the social media environment and create fair and open competition? What will this do for us users? You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, what are the rules here? Can I take off the mask when I speak? All right. Thank you, and thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, the European uh, Parliament is finalizing its position on the Digital Services Act, which is a piece of uh, legislation that sets new rules uh, for content uh, curation. Uh, but I will get into the details uh, of it. Um, but now, let me start from a bit of broader perspective. Uh, the internet has developed into an entity where a few dominant players uh, on the market decide over access to content. In other words, what users see. Google, Facebook, and possibly a few others are the main entrants um, to the web for a majority of people. And um, I'll borrow a term from another uh, piece of uh, upcoming European legislation, uh, which is called the Digital Markets Act. And I will call these the gatekeepers. Uh, these gatekeepers built their business models around uh, pervasive um, personal data collection about around its processing um, and then subsequent automated content curation. In other words, they decide what will be displayed to whom based on the personal data that they um, have collected and on the willingness to pay for audience. And the recommender systems are designed to maximize user engagement and by that maximize the profit. Now, how accurate does this uh, statement get in the context of uh, the recent revelations from Frances Hogan? She uncovered that Facebook was prioritizing content, evoking negative 
emotions that boosts anger and hate in the society. Uh, the power of content curators is worrisome in relation to our democracy then. Sorting content based on mass personal data collection, killing diversity of news and information, feeding users with shocking content and leading some of them deeper and deeper into rabbit holes of disinformation and conspiracy theories and shaping the public opinion by that. So what can we as policymakers do about that? Well, the first tool is transparency to oblige platforms to disclose why a particular content is displayed uh, to how many people, uh, label if it is promoted, uh, if it is promoted, um, uh, is it a political statement? Um, if it's a political statement, who, who financed it? Um, and these basic obligations need to apply to all to everyone. Uh, however, this is uh, really insufficient. Uh, we need ways to analyze and process the data. We need access to transparency, not only by an individual, not only by the users, but uh, also by NGOs and consumer organizations so that the ecosystem can be evaluated as a whole. And um, my very basic political premise when it comes to technologies is to give the control back to people they should be able to easily define and set their own content curation, what they want to be displayed and what is relevant for them. We need to give the decision about what is relevant into the hands of people. Now, back to the European legislation. The Parliament's position on the Digital Services Act, which will be voted in the committee just next week, defines obligations concerning uh, transparency of recommender systems. There is still room for uh, improvement, though. The obligations apply only to main parameters of the recommender system and exceptions uh, in the name of protection of trade secrets and so-called intellectual property pose a major threat to severe, uh, of severe limitations of the obligations. Also, the Digital Services Act defines additional obligations for very li large online platforms, and the Parliament's position makes it clear that they need to provide at least one recommender system that is not based on profiling. Unfortunately, it doesn't have to be the default one. And also there is no interoperability obligations that would make it possible for users to supply their own third party provided recommender system. And now speaking of interoperability, my last piece, um, one of uh, the uh, major priorities of my uh, political group in the Digital Markets Act is to introduce interoperability obligation for social networks. And that made it to the final parliament's position which will be voted in the plenary also next week. However, this obligation will be a major. Um, uh, uh, this obligation will be a major contributor to bringing competition back to the market by limiting the network effects that keep users locked in on a major platform. However, I see room for improvement uh, there as well. So, as you can see, the new European Digital Legislative Package delivers some improvements. However, to some extent, it is also a missed opportunity. Um, so, please keep your fingers crossed that we get the best out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcel. Um, our next panelist, well, the question is gonna be for Corey, and we're gonna talk about the privacy paradox. So Corey, could you please tell us what gains and risks in terms of data protection come with a diversified environment for content curators? And also how do we ensure that new players comply with high privacy and human rights standards? You have five minutes. Thank you, Marta. Uh, hello everyone, uh, both those of you who are remote and my fellow super spreaders here in the hall. Uh, when we talk about uh, these digital networks, we tend to overemphasize the role that network effects play in their dominance. Uh, we do see network effects at play with these large firms. They, they grow by dint of um, the fact that people want to join because people have already joined, right? You go to Facebook because your friends are on Facebook. And once you're there, that's a reason for someone else to join Facebook. But in light of all that, it's worth asking why people stay on Facebook or in any of the other walled gardens, because I don't think I've ever met anyone who's happy with any of them. It, it may not be possible to make a service that serves 3 billion users who are in hundreds of countries speaking hundreds and hundreds of languages whose uh, moderation norms can be adequately captured in a three ring binder that you can give to a traumatized subcontractor in the Pacific Rim. And as a result, you have people who stay but don't like it. 
And when you ask the firms why people stay there, they say, well, they're revealing their preference, right? That they're showing you that they actually don't mind it at all. If they did, they would just leave. But when you look at their private communications, you see something very different. You see, for example, in the amended complaint that the FTC brought against Facebook, that these firms deliberately engineer in high switching costs. Switching costs are what you have to give up when you leave a service. So in the uh, amended complaint against Facebook, you have executives sending memos to Mark Zuckerberg saying, we need to make our photos product really good so that people will lock their family photos up with us so that we can abuse them more to our benefit because who would leave if it means leaving behind your family photos. So um, all of this is to say that anything that allows people to lower their switching costs, right? To, to have somewhere else that they can go to get their curation, somewhere else that they can go to get some other service from these dominant platforms that has different rules and different policies that more closely reflect what they want and their values and, and their priorities is going to be to the good. It's going to be a corrective for these network effects because people can leave without having to surrender their contact with their friends and family. Now, the firms themselves will tell you that this will be a catastrophe for privacy reasons. The, uh, Facebook will say, if we allow people to use a service other than Facebook to talk to their Facebook friends, what would stop Cambridge Analytica from showing up and taking all of those users' data? We need to be there to defend those users, and we can only do that if we have a monopoly on how you talk to Facebook users. Well, there's an obvious rejoinder, which is that Facebook has already disqualified itself from defending us against Cambridge Analytica by failing to defend us against Cambridge Analytica. But there's a, another more important point that might get lost in there, which is that Facebook does in fact defend you against lots of attacks, as does Apple, as does Microsoft, as does Google. They just don't defend you against the attacks that are good for their shareholders that when it comes to your interests and their interests, their interests win. And if they think that you can't leave, then they will shift their conduct towards their benefit and to your detriment. Apple will defend your privacy unless you're a user in China, in which case Apple will surrender your privacy because the cost to their shareholders of losing access to Chinese manufacturing and consumers is too high. Microsoft will defend your privacy if you wanna use Bing, but not if you're an Office 365 user, in which case they'll gather data on every single thing you do and tell your boss about it. So um, all of these firms make poor guardians of our privacy. To hold them to account, what we need is not for these firms to use their own judgment about when your privacy matters and when it doesn't, but for there to be a freestanding privacy law, something like the GDPR or like the many federal uh, proposals we've had in the United States that allows users to have a private, I hear the music, that allows users to have their private right of action so that they can seek action. They don't have to convince a federal official that they need, um, uh, that their case is worth taking up. That is to say, we need universal standards for uh, when privacy is worth defending, not particularized standards or parochial standards set in corporate boardrooms. And we need fit tools for purpose. The fact that these firms say that the way that they're going to defend our privacy is by aggressively invoking cybersecurity law, copyright law, or contract law is absurd. It's like the firefighter telling you that they're going to put out your fire by aggressively using their Wi-Fi. If we want to fight fires, we use firefighting equipment. If we're going to fight for privacy, we should have privacy laws. And I'll close by saying that we are um, at a crossroads now in terms of how we relate to these firms. And you can see it in the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. There is a large constituency of people that would like firms to be better at being in charge of our digital lives, right? The problem with Mark Zuckerberg is that he's a bad digital king of 3 billion people's lives. And we'll make him a good digital king with the right laws or the right rules, or we'll replace him and have someone else be in charge of Facebook. And then there's a group of people who want to abolish the job of digital king for 3 billion people. And you kind of can't do both. So in the Digital Services Act, we have proposals for upload filters. These cost hundreds of millions of dollars. They're blunt instruments, and they enshrine the dominance of large platforms. In the Digital Markets Act, you have interoperability that would break the model that those upload filters rely on. And we really have to choose one or the other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, the next question is for Vittorio. Uh, Vittorio, which technical conditions and standards need to be in place for third parties, content curators to be able to do their jobs? 
And we're talking about interoperability and data security standards and the role of standard setting bodies. You have five minutes. Thank you. Well, yes, I'd, I'd like to provide a perspective from someone who has been involved in, in designing internal standards and in, in implementing internal technologies for quite some time. Uh, the first thing I, I'd like to stress is that what is being proposed here, unbundling uh, interoperability, is not really nothing new, not a weird idea that someone just came up with. It's actually one of the basic principles uh, over which the internet was built. If you go and read the, the architectural documents of, of the early mass internet from the 90s, like RSC 1958, there are some architectural principles like modularity and open standardization, which put together create interoperability and unbundling. They, they basically, the, the idea is that uh, internal services should be built over modules as small as possible that can be replaced and that interact with other modules uh, through open standards so that uh, multiple vendors, multiple pro service providers can provide the same service and you can choose one and replace one with the other and still interact with all the, the modules uh, nearby. Uh, so this is why the, the idea of unbundling the content curation algorithm is good and it's simply what is uh, what was originally considered one of the founding uh, elements and for success of for success of the internet so even the security and privacy concerns sort of fade away if you consider that we already have uh, open federated services like this i mean email the web are these internet services from the first generation and they are mostly still built over, over this over these principles and, and they are not less secure or less private than this new wave of uh, services like social media or instant messaging. And many of the problems that are inherent in having, for example, multiple different providers treating your data have already been solved for this. I mean, we just need to, to do the same. Another good example, which recently came in force is the European Payment Services Directive number two, which has created basically a way for third parties to aggregate uh, your personal banking information for multiple banks where you, you have a an account or a relationship with, and then uh, arrange the content and present it to you in a way you like. So this is exactly what we should do here for content creation of a social media. And it's already been done and it works and people are happy about it. So, so the, I mean, it, there could be problems but, of implementation, but they have mostly already been solved. So that the, the sky will not fall, uh, fall uh, over our heads because we introduced this kind of unbundling. And in terms of technical standards, there are already many technical standards. I mean, there's a activity pub, which is a W3C standard for federated social media. There's a, social, a distributed federated social media network like Mastodon, which is already working on it, and it serves millions of people. So again, it, this is not some weird abstract concept. It's something that already works. Uh, there might be, there will be the need to define more standards and um, fix with the, the ones that already are there, complete them. The internet already has standardization organizations. The, the view maybe is uh, somehow different with, depending on whether you're from Europe or you're from the US, because traditionally the global internet standardization organizations have been uh, mostly led by US people and US companies. So I understand that in Europe, there is a bit of concern that if you just defer this, these activities to the global internet SDOs, the result might be that the big tech companies from the US that, I mean, that we, we want to constrain, we will still dominate the technical discussion there. Europe has an alternative system of standardization organizations like Etsy, which unfortunately have not been so open to internet technologies, especially to participation by other than Euro big European companies. So it's, uh, again, I think we, we should find a good model. The, the message I want to, to give is that we possibly need both. We need multi-stakeholder discussion over these standards, and uh, we possibly need to let the internet standardization organization work on them and propose them, but we also need the regulators to check what is being done then and ensure that it, it meets the, the public concerns and the public policy objectives. But in the end, to, to close, the, the last message I want to give is that I absolutely agree that we, we should do both. So uh, there are, yes, I heard this, there are two. <laughs> There are two types. I mean, interoperability is both vertical, meaning that you separate the services into smaller modules, and it's horizontal, meaning that you can replace the service provider with another one. We should get both. So in, in a way, we could introduce some bundling of content curation and even moderation algorithms 
which is vertical interoperability. And we should also introduce competition and regulation against the network effects so that you get horizontal interoperability and more service providers. And in the end, I am a long-term Facebook user with like 12,000 followers and I cannot switch to anything else because I would lo lose my, my friends that I discuss it every day, though I also hate Facebook. So that, that's really the situation we are in. And Facebook makes me really angry by presenting me with lots of anti-vax content because I'm one of the people posting scientific content and arguing against that. And so they give me more of that and they make my life really terrible. So I really look forward to having the ability to choose the content I, I really want to see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vittorio. And the last question of this first round goes to Agustina. Agustina, how do we escape from the data exploitation logic of usual business models? Are alternative business models even possible? And you know, taking into account communities of content creators and moderators. You have five minutes. Yeah. Oh, Agustina was just here and I think she logged out accidentally. Yeah. Okay, so we have a little problem with that, but it doesn't matter. We can go with her after and we can start the second round. And the second round is gonna be one same question for everyone. Let me see if Agustina is not here. Okay, she's not here. Um, so it's gonna be the same question for all of our experts. And the question is, how will you make this proposal better? How will you improve it? What will you add? What will you remove? You don't have to explain why. You sure have your expert reasons, but we just wanna hear like straightforward ideas. And you just have a three minutes to answer this question. So remember when you when one minute is missing, I'm gonna start playing the song. So we're gonna follow the same order to leave room for Agustina to join. So Marcel, how would you improve this proposal? You have three minutes. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you mean the proposal of unbundling? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm not sure uh, we need to um, improve the proposal itself. I think uh, we need to um, improve uh, legislation so that it allows um, this to happen. So as Vittorio said, that was, I think, uh, very right on spot um, that um, we need both vertical and horizontal interoperability. Um, I uh, pushed uh, really, really hard in the Digital Markets Act, uh, because I'm the shadow reporter uh, for that, for interoperability obligations and having even very specific obligations when it comes to interoperability uh, for chat platforms and uh, social network services. So that um, is the horizontal type of um, uh, interoperability obligation that would make it possible that if users um, are on Facebook, they could also uh, talk to their friends that are on other social networks, like on Mastodon, for instance. Well, Mastodon it itself is actually a, an example of a social network that is federated, which means interoperable horizontally between the different instances of um, its own network. If I am on one instance, I can talk to my friends on other instances. But in addition to that, and this is what this proposal is about, it is also important to think about, okay, if we have some really large um, uh, online platforms that uh, are dominant on the market and concentrate so much power, it would also make sense to um, introduce interoperability vertical that would make it possible to functionally separate uh, the different components of that particular platform, which means that if uh, Facebook uh, provides hosting of the social network, it not necessarily means that they also have to provide content curation. They could, but they should be, uh, but users should be able to provide their own recommender system, their own content curation that would uh, make it possible to, to introduce competition on the market of content curation. 
Thank you so much for this answer. And then we're going to go with Corey. Uh, how will you improve this proposal? And you have three minutes. So I think if we're going to make the proposals sturdy, we need to think not just about how they work, but what happens when they fail and how they fail. So you heard Vittorio talk about how standards can be hijacked by big firms. I've spent 20 years having my brains melted in standards meetings by big firms that hijack standards. I, I know that it's true. It happens. It's real. So what can you do to ensure that uh, when a standard is hijacked or when the future comes along and people have curation needs that were not countenanced in the original regulation to ensure that the law keeps up with the pace of technology. And for that, I think we just need to look to technology's past. Historically, it has been common for new market entrants to create interoperability without permission against the wishes of dominant actors. So you had uh, plug compatible mainframe components that did this to IBM in the 60s and 70s. You had Apple doing it to Microsoft with the iWork suite, which reads and writes uh, Microsoft Office files. Um, there's no reason that we couldn't still be doing that. There's no reason that a new firm couldn't come up that would go and scrape your waiting Facebook messages and put them in a new inbox for you on another service and let you reply to them and push them back out to Facebook. Well, actually, there is one reason, which is that Facebook would use the law to reduce you to a radioactive crater, which is what they've done to everyone who's tried it. So what we need to do is immunize people who engage in this form of adversarial interoperability from liability under a variety of legal theories, cybersecurity, contract, copyright, um, this huge arsenal that tech firms have amassed that they use to fence off adversarial interoperators. We actually have a special word for adversarial interoperability at EFF because it's a cruelty to ask a non-native English speaker to say adversarial interoperability. So we say competitive compatibility, which we can shorten to ComCom, -com, which is kind of fun to say. So we can use ComCom -com as, as the other side of a, of a seesaw where on the one side you have these mandates that um, we're gonna make as good as we can and that we're gonna enforce as vigorously as we can. But on the other side, you have the possibility of open guerrilla warfare, where if the standard doesn't do what you need to do or if the firm is messing with the standard to exclude you from it, all you need to do is figure out how to make it work on your own. Now, firms will often have their hands stayed by the threat of that because it represents unlimited potential, potential technical and financial downsides to them because they're going to have to fight off these new interoperators that are going in through a back door they're making themselves. And so they, may just, they might just come into compliance as a result. But if they don't, you have a remedy available. You have people who are being frustrated by the shenanigans of these large firms who can engage in self-help. And in order to make that work, and in order to ensure that we can distinguish ComCom -com from, say, hacking Facebook and stealing all their users' data, again, we need a freestanding privacy and data protection regime that doesn't distinguish between whether Facebook is doing you wrong or whether someone who's interoperating with Facebook is doing you wrong. And, in, and it doesn't ask Facebook to make that call but instead asks democratically accountable officials to make that call. And so that's what I think we need to do to make this uh, sturdy. Otherwise, what we're going to see is even if we get it implemented, we're going to have to fight forever to keep the large firms from uh, neutering it. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have the same question for Vittorio, but before I pass the mic to him, I wanted just to let you know that Agustina is facing some connectivity issues. So if she's back, we're gonna ask her to answer the first question of the first round. But if not, I'll let Maria Luisa to have a quick uh, wrap up. So Vittorio, same question. How would you improve this proposal? And you have three minutes. Well, uh, speaking of the proposal in itself, I think that we should do more unbundling. And one particularly important thing that should be unbundled from all these platform services is identity. Identity, single sign-on, because we have a sort of almost hidden oligopoly by mostly Google, Facebook, and Apple now uh, in, the, in how you log into these services. And this is really creating basically an opportunity for them to track, track whatever you do with, over the internet without uh, really having to track you. So, I mean, it's you that tell them uh, all the websites you log into and they just collect the data. So you should be allowed to put your identity, your personal information somewhere else 
and use that information within the social media platform of your choice and also within the instant messaging service and within any other website and any other service you want you should really be able to to I mean pick your identity provider and the problem now paradoxically is that there are too many <laughs> open identity projects and so, I mean, there is no real competitor to these closed ones. We, we really need to find one. And by the way, Europe has the IDAS, which is really a, a great thing, but it only works for big, I mean, strong public administration login. It, it doesn't really work for everyday use and it never will. So we need something else that is fit for everyday usage. And uh, more in general, I mean, since we have the, an MEP here, I, I think that uh, we, we should, try not to make these proposals too much focused on specific services. I mean, of course, the, it, now social media is all the rage and we, we need to address that. But maybe maybe we, we we solve all the social media issues and in five years, it's something different where public opinion forms and we exchange information in WeChat. So we need to establish these things as principles for all services, for all cases. So I'm, I'm really happy that we got this new, the two new clauses in the DMA about social media and, and instant messaging, but we should really, if possible, try to get a general principle in that, saying that any dominant uh, uh, platform in, in platform services of public relevance should interoperate with third parties so that there can be competition. And this is the kind of, of reasoning that we need to have. And it also helps to prevent uh, the, the risk of ossifying regulation so that you I mean, you prevent innovation. This is an objection you, you often get. But if you limit yourself to this kind of high level architectural principles, and then let maybe the technical implementation part deal with that service of the moment, I think that the result will be pretty positive. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, Maria Luisa, could you please give us a wrap up of all of the interventions of our panelists? And then we are going to go with questions and answers from the public. So if you have anything you want to be set straight or anything, just please let us know and we can ask our panelists, including Maria Luisa. So Maria Luisa, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Uh, well, the, the first way I have to wrap up is to is to thank you all for all this this uh, very uh, um, well thought uh, comments and um, for uh, flagging a variety of challenges and uh, and strengths that are part of this proposal. By the way, uh, we have shared on on the chat the link to our policy brief, and it's it's going to be on our. Uh, webpage if, if anyone else wants to have a look and uh, we we're, we're going to be more than happy happy to um, uh, receive your comments and suggestions uh, it seems to me that uh, there there is a, a sort of a consensus uh, among us that interoperability is a sort of a building block of of the digital uh, environment that uh, was created uh, in the 90s as victoria reminded us but also of that vision that we have about the future and how we want to interact with services and products online in the future of possibly from now on, from today on, or from yesterday, even better. Um, so this is, uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, definitely interoperability uh, and shaping this right will be an essential component of uh, this specific unbundling uh, proposal for hosting and content creation, and uh, um, uh, this uh, and, and and possibly for many more uh, markets that are uh, currently locked in and uh, um, um, where where gatekeepers dominate. Um, the uh, there are a couple of, of, of things that I've noted down, uh, which is definitely uh, this idea of, of what to do uh, if if something fails, if the, st the standard fails, etc. And I do believe that there, uh, what, one of the, the, the biggest safeguard is to um, uh, ensure as much transparency as possible, to engage uh, uh, users as much as possible in this kind of discussion, uh, and uh, and try to avoid that the solutions to fix the problems come always from from the same. Uh, uh, player uh, and always from the same direction, but they're uh, but to, to sort of try to set the condition for these kind of choices uh, it, from this balancing uh, exercise in between variety of trade offs and risks to be performed by society as a whole and not by just a handful of players. And uh, what else can I say uh, when it comes to more unbundling and uh, trying to get it right for the DSA and the DMA? Uh, well, one of one of the the the, um, the 
most frustrating uh, things in the past couple of weeks has been when uh, a number of proposals that were tabled for Article 29 of the DSA to uh, include this sort of unbundling and interoperability for third party recommended systems uh, was uh, not uh, sufficiently endorsed and, and supported. So there, I think uh, we are again, uh, uh, we've seen that there is some, some consensus. Having said that, uh, we, we are, uh, I am absolutely convinced that Article 19 with this proposal is at the beginning. Uh, we, have, uh, we are happy to have put something on the table. It's, it's, it can be improved. Uh, and uh, our call is a call for every stakeholder to contribute to that improvement if they want to. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for the moment. And uh, is Abstinaba or not? Thank you, Maria Lisa. No, she's not back. But um... If she comes back, we can we can let her in in our discussion. But in the meantime, do any does anyone have any questions for our panelists or any ideas you would like to share? A reaction you love it, you hate it, why? Uh, please share it with us. Otherwise, I don't know if the panelists want to react to the intervention of Maria Luisa. Yes, I see Marcel. Yes. There's a tiny camera. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, that was me <laughs> who raised my hand. Um, uh, uh, not uh, to Maria Lusa, but to what has been said before um, um, by uh, Vittorio on interoperability. I totally agree that we must not stop with interoperability of social networks and uh, chat platforms, with uh, which in um, uh, the European legislation jargon is number independent interpersonal communication services. Um, and there is actually, as a matter of fact, a, a broader, a more general interoperability clause in the Digital Markets Act. And I'm really happy uh, that it got into there. But I'm also sure that only the time will show uh, what it really means, how this is going to be implemented, how this will really work. And I am also sure that we will need some revision after a couple of years um, to reflect the development on the market. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah, go ahead, Marie. Marta, may I? Yeah. I, I, I wanted to bring something up that uh, didn't work into my main remarks that I think is a way to optimize standardization and mandates, which is the standards process always includes uh, a part where you decide what the standard is for, what it's going to do, and then a part where you describe how the standard works. And you can split those two parts uh, uh, from one another, functional requirement and the, and the implementation. And one thing that, that you can do to kind of future-proof things and allow for innovation and make it easier for uh, new market entrants to determine whether or not the standard is being adhered to or not, is to make the reference implementation from the standard the safe harbor. So you know that you're, you're complying with the law if you implement it the way the standards body says you should. But you can also do anything you want so long as it fulfills the requirements. And that allows firms that have ideas that are incompatible with the implementation, but that still satisfy the requirements to go ahead and it forestalls the argument that you are freezing in amber the dynamic process by which large firms uh, uh, make and update their services. There's an old saying in tech standardization that an API is a promise, right? And so if we're going to ask them to make a promise that they'll never break for 50 years, maybe we can let them kind of set the contours of that promise, not the minimum part of that promise, but the exact framework for that promise. And then, you know, we still have the ability to go to a regulator or go to court and argue about whether their implementation does meet the requirements, right? That's still intact, but you, you're not having a government committee write software for Facebook, which I think is probably something most of us would prefer. Thank you, Corey. Um, Vittorio, would you like to take the mic or you're okay? I mean, I, I'm fine. I think we could talk about this for hours, but I'd really like to, <laughs> to hear someone from the audience if there's anyone that has anything to say or to suggest. Are we all agreeing on this? I think with yeah, the proposal so as uncontroversial as ours that we couldn't expect any disagreement, so. <laughs> I think that's good. So yeah, so I, I can't actually see anyone from the audience, but if you have any questions or reactions, 
please let us know. There's one, I really cannot see. Would you please have like hand him or her the mic? We have a question. You there, total stranger. What is your question? <laughs> Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Um, Corey may have heard this question before. So I, I am, um, I'm, I'm a, I like the proposal. I'm a, I'm a, a, a enthusiastic uh, supporter of, of these type of interoperability, competitive compatibility mandates. One of the things I think about is um, whether they solve any of the other problems we try to solve on the internet or whether this is really um, purely a, a benefit to users and a user empowerment thing. And one of the obstacles I always come upon um, is, uh, is what I tend to call sort of the stupid neighbor problem, where we think that um, if I have the ability to choose a different service, I will, but I worry about my neighbor who gets seduced by all the fake things they see on Facebook, and they're still going to make bad choices. And so I, one of the things I try and think about is, is does interoperability help with that? at all. Um, most people don't think that with, with misinformation, for example, most people, if you'd ask someone, they'd say, well, misinformation is not a problem for me because I can sort it out. I can figure it out, right? And if I had a different service to go to that had less information, that'd be great for me. But it wouldn't solve the problem because there's some people who aren't smart enough you know, to go to a different service. So I, I'm, I just, I, I, this is my unformed question. To what's what's the limitations of this in trying to solve problems? And, and then the other concern is that are we is there a problem we're creating or exacerbating if we do this? And, and I don't know the answer uh, to that, but that's what I think about a lot. Thank you so much. This is such an important question. And Maria Luisa wants to answer it. So uh, Maria Luisa, go ahead. Well, I'm sure that each of each of the panelists has an, has an answer as well, but I maybe I can just uh, break the ice and say, uh, well, uh, a couple of things. There are, there are a number of relevant things to answer to this question. Um, I think uh, the, the premise is uh, when we talk about the unbundling of hosting and content creation, we're not giving up on having rules for content moderation. So we're not giving up on having human rights standards for content moderation. Uh, it, it doesn't matter which kind of provider uh, we use. So our idea is that this very much complements human rights standards for, for content moderation. The second point is, it is true uh, that there is always the risk that certain people, they actually want to be exposed to a certain content that we might deem not to be worth it. Uh, well, two elements there. First of all, we need to keep, uh, I think we need to keep separated when it comes to illegal content or what has been, you know, variously defined or labeled as harmful, but legal content or certain similar definitions, because for, for the good or for the bad, this is part of our free expression. So if someone wants to look for harmful content, uh, I think as a society, we need to cope with the fact that, uh, yes, they're free to do it, as long as it's not illegal for international or national law. Uh, the other point is, um, it is true that how we can we can try to uh, I wouldn't say fix it, but I, we can try to minimize this risk if we care about you know the entire society being well off, better off. Uh, one 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 major difference that I see is that this is already happening, but now it's happening in a very untransparent way. People are not aware, not enough, not sufficiently, and they have no choices. If you implement this unbundling, you create a diversified environment with a number of choices, etc. At least we're going to have the transparency. At least people are going to be a little bit more aware. At least they will need to have to, to perform an active choice to go and look for that content. But they will not. What I'm trying to say is that ideally, a diversified environment to empower users is going to make them more active in their user, in their uh, online experience. While at nowadays, what I see is that the majority of us, we are just passively taking everything is provided to us. Uh, so this, I think in, in the medium and long term, this is ideally what I would like to say. And uh, sorry, what I would like to see happening. Um, yeah. Thank you, Maria Lisa. Um, Corey has a reaction and also Vittorio. So I'm gonna give the mic first to, ah, okay. Corey, Vittorio, and then Marcel. 
So uh, I, I guess it depends on what your theory of why people are looking at stuff we think of as radicalizing or, or disinformation is there. So there's one theory, the, the kind of mind control theory that Mark Zuckerberg made a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners, and then Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle into a QAnon, right? And if you think that, then yeah, if we, if we let people have more than one place to go, maybe the mind control won't work anymore. There is another possibility, right? Which is that your uncle was always a racist. And I don't know that, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know that we can solve that with, um, by, by making it illegal to be, uh, to have racist ideas or to go into forums with other racists and talk about racism, uh, notwithstanding uh, human rights frameworks and what have you. If something is lawful to utter in your kitchen among friends, there will be digital kitchens in which people will gather and say those things. And I, I, I think that any attempt to stamp that out with moderation policies, as we've seen, is going to do more harm than good. It's it's going to capture more counter speech than speech. After all, um, there are a lot of people who tolerate a lot of things that are indistinguishable from racial abuse online, but that don't actually cross the line. That the difference between almost but not quite racial abuse and racial abuse are is is indistinguishable to the person who's experiencing it. And so there are lots of ways that you can violate the spirit of that law without ever committing uh, uh, a, an unlawful speech act. And really by giving people a place to go where the community is small enough and the moderation is sensitive enough to the local norms that they can make those fine grained and nuanced distinctions because the people making those distinctions are part of the affected community is, is the best hope we have for keeping people out of harm's way of that uh, lawful but awful speech. Vittorio? Yes, I think there are at least two parts to this story. The, the first one is that uh, in, uh, in regulatory terms, uh, creating competition is not enough if you don't uh, let them people I mean, actually choose it. And uh, the, the dominant platforms will do whatever they, they want and they can to prevent people from actually choosing competitors even, even once uh, they exist. And we've seen that with cookie pop-ups, for example, which in theory, you, you need to give consent, but in practice, they nudge you into giving consent even without realizing it. So, I mean, you don't just need to, to introduce some bundling, you need, you need to introduce principles on, uh, I mean, for example, non-self-preferencing non or defaults or pre-installation of apps, all these kinds of things. But you do need to introduce them at the high level, not to be prescriptive, like exactly on mobile phones today. You need, I mean, that, that, that needs to be left to an implementation phase with the regulators and, and the multi-stakeholder technical community. But then once you actually get to, 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 to give a practical choice to users, then it's true that there will be users that make bad choices. And there are many people that are afraid of that. Actually, my interactions with MEPs, not from the same party as myself, other groups, I, I got that answer. I said, okay, you're proposing to have a federated open uh, interoperable social media, but then how do we get content taken down promptly? It's much easier to get uh, this information taken down if we only have one big social media provider and we tell them what to do. And uh, I, I replied, yes, I mean, it's also easier to avoid this information if you only have one newspaper in your country and then, I mean, they're, they're the only thing you, people you have to talk with. But we've decided long ago that that's not good for other reasons. So it's, it's exactly the same. I mean, social media are the newspapers of today also. And so we, we need to apply that at the same scale, the same principles. But also the other thing I'm wary of is that this argument is exactly what is being used by big tech to deprive users of choice. So if you talk with people at, uh, let's not make names, Apple, they, they tell you that they have to introduce uh, super encrypted, super closed super systems and take over DNS and other things uh, that traditionally were provided by your ISP or uh, other part or other third parties, because in that way they can ensure your privacy and security because they can control everything. And uh, I mean, th there is some merit to the fact, I mean, th that they can prevent you from making bad choices, but not giving you a, a choice. But still, that's extremely dangerous because this is building again and again this kind of centralized, closed, opaque uh, ecosystem in which you, no one has a word except the CEO of these companies. And now that everything gets encrypted, you, you don't even know where your data are going and you have really no control over what they are doing uh, about your data and, and your things. So, uh, I mean, I, I take that the, I mean, the, the, the concern is, is valid, but we have to be careful uh, and not to uh, allow other people to use it for their own business interests. Thank you, Vittorio. Marcel? Uh, yeah, speaking of um, uh, newspapers, uh, it's indeed not a good idea uh, to uh, 
to have just uh, one uh, publisher uh, in the country, even though it's um, easier to control what is in there. Unfortunately, um, uh, even in some European countries um, um, uh, that joined the European Union as democratic countries, we see this trend of uh, consolidation of uh, the media landscape and then them becoming uh, either under uh, state control or uh, oligarchs con control. And that's another very dangerous trend, but completely off topic here, of course. Um, what um, is relevant in terms of disinformation and it's not connected with unbundling, but I think it really needs to be mentioned, is the way how the content is spread. Uh, the content is amplified uh, by those social uh, network uh, platforms in a way that they you know, do the content curation and they prioritize, uh, they prioritize the content that you see, but of course they want to make money out of it. The tool that they have at hand is that they know, oh, um, these five people here in the room, they actually believe that um, the earth is flat. And over there, these five people, they actually uh, think uh, some, that some other conspiration, uh, conspiracy theory uh, is very valid. So why don't we throw them with some other ideas uh, a, an, an advertiser may think uh, and can target specifically these groups of people. And this can only work if we collect the vast, uh, um, the, if we collect the, the enormous amount of personal data. And then we do a so-called targeted advertising, which actually should be called surveillance advertising or tracking-based advertising. And I believe that we truly need to regulate this and we actually need a ban of surveillance advertising because if we do not do this, then it will be extremely easy to amplify um, uh, such content. Now, if this was not possible, I would even say that it would be extremely difficult to amplify such content because then how, how do you do it? Of course, there are ways, um, but uh, the truth is that today, if you want to spread disinformation, then you have to throw a, a large amount of money at it in the very beginning, and this wouldn't be uh, possible anymore to target it. So the tool actually would be very ineffective. Thank you, Marcel. And I think, like you said, it's not really part of the unbundled, but I think it's part of the problem to try to analyze all parts of what meaningful connectivity entails and how I was also thinking that uh, we have four minutes and they then they will shut us down. So I'm just going to be quick. I was thinking about the unbundling and how it relates to other efforts such as the oversight board and when it's like no net neutrality and you have zero rating. So it means it, it will entail that the same platforms will be able to have the same power or why not? So maybe Maria Lisa, you can explain a little bit more. If this is like a combo solution or you need like several regulatory frameworks or, or policies uh, at the same time to be, or, or to, yeah, to be able to decrease their power, the platforms. When you have like two minutes, sorry. Uh well, um, uh, just to jump in very, very briefly, I think uh, that once, uh, once again, uh, all, all these concerns that we have raised, they're all legitimate and uh, most probably we have no one-stop shop solution to fix them all. Uh, I, I still believe that uh, if, if we do uh, open up markets and we, if we diversify and decentralize the environment, we, we have uh, way more chances to see a variety of, of business model appearing and a variety of, of services uh, that, uh, are, that, uh, that are diverse and they, they could um, um, provide better um, compliance with, uh, with uh, disinformation issues or privacy issues and so on and so forth. Um, the, the main, so the main, the main point, I think, is to try to uh, figure out a way uh, to have uh, this variety uh, this diverse landscape uh, and, uh, and also uh, complementary to that to find a way to empower uh, consumers as much as possible. 
Um, as I said at the beginning, I don't think the unbundling of hosting and content creation can fix all these things at all uh, at, at once. But I do believe that if we don't have interoperable services and we, if we don't have open markets, if we don't have alternative players, if we don't have user empowerment, then we have, it is going to be extremely difficult to fix any other challenge, being this disinformation, uh, surveillance, target, targeted uh, surveillance, advertising, uh, the spread of hate speech, and so on and so forth. Thank Marta, you so much. Say a closing word? Yeah, but just we have one minute. Okay. Go ahead. Very quickly. So I want to say that I actually think the fact that this has more moving pieces is a feature and not a bug. So when we talk about media consolidation, we're talking about the same underlying economic policy choices that created tech consolidation. It wasn't an accident that the web turned into five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. It was merger forbearance and a tolerance for anti-competitive conduct. People suffer under that in every realm. Two companies own all the breweries. One company owns all the eyewear. There's four companies that own all the shipping uh, uh, lines, and they keep building bigger and bigger container ships that get stuck in the Suez Canal. We are all laboring under some form of monopoly. And the fact that there are other elements of this problem that are um, not tech problems, but rather problems with concentration in other sectors, doesn't mean that we have to solve all the problems at once. It means we have an army of allies in every sector, cheerleaders who can only get their uniforms from one company, runners who can only get their shoes from two companies, right? All of these people are on the same side as us. They just don't know it yet. So that I think is the uh, ultimate uh, strength that we have in the fact that this is this big wicked problem with so many different facets. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Marcel, Cory, Vittorio, Maria Luisa. Thanks the audience here and like in Zoom and there. Thank you. Have a great day. I'm sorry I have to say goodbye this fast, but sorry. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.